morning uh, here from at the annual meeting here uh, of the World Economic Forum in Davos. I would like to uh, welcome all of you here in the room. I would also like to welcome all of you who are watching us uh, online. We are here for a very, very important session on, uh, on uh, Eurasia. It's called a new dawn for Eurasia. There has been a lot of happening in this space, however we define it. Obviously, there have been uh, geopolitical shifts. Uh, there are shifts when, with, uh, when it comes to the energy transformation. Um, uh, we have uh, other shifts in the global economy. And Eurasia uh, has uh, uh, become uh, or has been more in the spotlight, I would say, uh, as a result. And uh, we have been at the World Economic Forum following this space uh, quite actively. Uh, we had a session on it uh, here last year. And we have some ongoing work uh, on particularly the Middle Corridor, which has become so famous uh, in recent years uh, here uh, at the Forum. So this is really an update uh, for us with distinguished leaders from different economies for us to understand where we are with that connectivity between uh, Europe uh, and Asia, uh, a very, very important trade route, very, very important, for example, uh, energy route. Uh, my name is Mirek Dushek. I'm a managing director at the World Economic Forum, and I'm joined for this discussion by really an august panel, I have to say. Let me uh, introduce you, um, Aleksandr Vucic, president of Serbia. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you. Prime Minister of Georgia, Irakli Garibashvili, a warm welcome uh, to you. Uh, Madame Odile Françoise Renaud Basso, EBRD, you are the president there, a uh, huge actor um, in the region. Uh, we have here um, Alibek Kuantirov, uh, Minister of National Economy uh, of Kazakhstan, a key economy in Central Asia. Uh, and on the middle corridor as well. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Tseng Alper, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Sabanchi Holding in Turkey. Uh, Turkey, obviously, an, an, an important economy uh, on this route too, but also your business is, is quite, quite relevant uh, here. So if I could start with you, Mr. President, um, Mr. Vucic, um, I never underestimate how important it is for people to just get an updated understanding of the economy. And so I've looked up the economy of Serbia, and maybe some of my data is even outdated, but just for everyone to know, um, the biggest economy in the, in the Western Balkans is actually the 24th largest economy in Europe uh, overall, uh, about $10,000 per capita, GDP overall 64 billion, if I looked correctly, uh, GDP. 68.5. <laughs> and also dy dynamism important, 2%, uh, at least if I looked, I think with the October numbers, 2% predicted for 2023 growth, for 2024. 2.6, 2.6. We, we have a flush assessment. Excellent. And 3.6, IMF uh, predicted 3.5. We believe it is going to be 3.6 in 2024. Perfect. So if I could just the nuts and bolts of the Serbian economy uh, at this point in time, but also I know that you have some upcoming announcements on uh, the growth horizon um, for the next five years. So if you could also share with us some of those forward-looking pieces uh, that you're working on in your government. And congratulations also uh, on, your, uh, um, on, on, the, on the election. So over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. This is for me a topic of an utmost importance because people, when we meet with European leaders, because all of us in Europe, we believe that we are a center of gravity, that uh, we decide anyway of, on everything. But uh, what is actually happening in the world is that the power, particularly economic power, is shifting towards Asia, and uh, we need to understand that. We that actually are living and uh, will always live in Europe and will always be a part of Europe. 
And uh, this kind of uh, connectivity or interconnectivity with Asian countries is of an utmost importance for us. And first of all, it was a good decision to found this new institute, new European institute, and uh, that's why I commend European leaders, which is European political community. Mm -hmm. At least twice a year we can discuss all these issues with <clears throat> my friend Iraqi Garibashvili, with our friends from Moldova, Ukraine, some other countries, Azerbaijan, mm. which are with Armenia, which have never been presented in European institutions, and that means that we gather know much more about them, and they gather know much more about us. Number two, uh, speaking about the economy, I can brag myself, but it's not time for that about results, and I'm always dissatisfied with any kind of results that we have, we have accomplished so far because I believe that we can do always much better and much bigger things for our people. But uh, yeah, uh, since 2012, 2013, uh, we more than doubled our overall GDP from 32 billion to almost 69 billion. And uh, yes, the countries of Western Balkans, Southeast Europe, they have a bigger growth rate than European Union. As you know, an estimated flash estimation for the growth of European Union countries is, zero, is 0 0.6 this year. And uh, for the next year, the last foreseen made by the World Bank is 0 0.9. Mm. And uh, it's uh, still this kind of assessments, estimations are still plunging, <laughs> speaking about European Union. And our a bit surging, not skyrocketing, but still surging, mm. which is good for us. But it means that our economy is consistent, speaking about, let's say, FDIs. 60 to 64 percent of overall FDIs are coming from Europe. But more than 32, 33 percent are coming from Asia. It's China, it's Japan, it's South Korea. And now we need to, we need to steer in a proper way. Mm -hmm. uh, our boat and to see how we can attract as much as we can to make smaller that gap between us and the most developed countries in Europe. At the same time, speaking about that middle route, middle corridor that you mentioned, it's becoming more and more important. And uh, still, northern route is of an utmost importance, but middle route is becoming more and more important. And uh, it's all about connectivity. And uh, that's what we were doing, uh, making these interconnectors between us and Bulgaria, always having big support of EBRD and EIB in all these projects. I believe that when we're going to do this interconnector, speaking about energy, connectivity with North Macedonia will also have a big support of EBRD or EIB as well, because we'll have to connect ourselves to tap and turn up mm -hmm. uh, gas pipeline. But we also need to build build an oil pipeline towards Hungary. Now we have the only one through Croatia to Serbia, uh, Yanov. And uh, these are all very important things because let me define this and then I'm finished. We have two big issues today which are very much interconnected. One is geopolitics, another one is economy. Economy means life, but there is no life without resolving some geopolitical issues because we easily are getting used to the war in Ukraine. That's, there are no news from Ukraine, mm. although there is a terrible war. Not a big news, whatever might happen today in Gaza, because, okay, some civilians are dying, people are dying, but we got used to that, unfortunately, of course. Something happened between Houthis, they started attacking big shipments uh, coming through uh, Red Sea Channel. Well, that was a big news for seven days. Not a big news anymore, but there is a problem. There is a big problem, because that, may, that is making a huge impact on all our economies. You saw the Marsk statement, a Danish company, you saw everything that was happening after that, because that will increase an overall uh, expenses, operational expenses of all the companies in an entire Europe. That will also make a big impact on bigger cuts and deterioration of growth rate in the future in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, if you ask me, 
of the biggest interests of not Serbia, we are a small country, a uh, small place, speaking about number of inhabitants and territory as well, but speaking about a, an entire Europe, building all channels, all routes, all uh, connectivity lines with Asia, this is of an utmost importance for us, although it doesn't look that, like that today. And uh, yes, uh, just to refer to your words, uh, on Saturday we are going to present a big plan and we hope that we'll have a great support from you, Madame Renovaso, from the other people, because we have had so far terrific experiences with EBRD. Mm -hmm. They have always been very helpful, but we took care of our public debt to GDP rate, ratio. It's 51.4%, which is one of the lowest in Europe, yes. better than 90% of EU countries. We have always been taking care of that. We always were choosing the presence of IMF, doesn't matter whether it was a precautionary arrangement or a standby arrangement, now we don't need their money. We, that's why it is just precautionary arrangement. But you need to have someone that will supervise, that will overview your public finances, which was good. That's why we are hoping to get EBRD on board to be helpful on energy connectivity issues on uh, because there is a big issue and then I'm, end, uh, then I'm ending it's uh, let's say AI yesterday I was listening to President Macron I, uh, I come here to listen to people and he was speaking about something that we have never discussed which is AI issue if we're going to use AI in our industries technologies and everything else it'll mean much bigger consumption of electricity where are we going to find it? What we need to do? We need to build new hydropower plants. We need to uh, reversibles. Uh, we need to do many, many things, and we need to invest hugely. And that's why we need them. That's why we need many other things. And also, once again, connectivity with all these countries, all kind of connectivities, economic trade, transportational connectivity, uh, energy resources connectivity, uh, but also digital connectivity, uh, AI institutes and institutions connectivity and everything else. Sorry that I took a lot of your time. Mr. President, thank you so much. Uh, uh, very interesting, uh, very informative as well. Thank you. If I could move to you, Prime Minister um, uh, Garibashvili, also if you could just, the nuts and bolts of your economy right now, again, I know a lot has been happening. You've had some records in trade turnover, for example. So help us just understand where Georgian economy is right now, where it's, where it's headed. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this very important panel. And I also want to join you for in congratulating my dear friend, President Vucic, thank you, thank you. on his great victory. Um, Georgia's economy right now is, is uh, developing rapidly. In the last three years, Georgia's economy grew very fast, and right now we're one of the fastest developing economies in the world. Uh, two years ago, Georgia's economy grew by 10.5%. Uh, also in 2022, uh, 10.4%. Uh, last year, 7%. Inflation is very low. Uh, last seven months, it was below 1%. This year, we expect to have uh, more than 5% economic growth. This is very conservative uh, assessment. Uh, so therefore, it's a very good, uh, stable situation. Uh, politically, also, Georgia is very stable. Um, and also, you measure trade, and everything is growing. Uh, of course, we are expanding our trade uh, uh, connections and relationship. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I also want to mention that FDI was also record number uh, last year. <clears throat> and um, so, therefore, especially after the uh, decision that was made uh, in December that Georgia became an EU candidate country, we expect more FDIs to flow into Georgia. So. Um, my dear colleague, President Vucic, mentioned uh, connectivity. Of course, Georgia, as you know, is, uh, has a very important geo, uh, strategic location, and uh, we are absolutely committed to, uh, to the uh, development of this so-called middle corridor, mm -hmm. which, is, which, which is becoming a very interesting, attractive alternative route. Uh, two years ago, we signed a very important uh, uh, roadmap together with our colleagues from Kazakhstan and also from Azerbaijan. Uh, we, have, we have a very clear, uh, let's say, plan how to develop uh, this corridor, mm -hmm. uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and vice versa. 
So we know exactly what, to, what needs to be done. It means uh, the expansion of uh, ports uh, capacity, it means uh, modernization of railways, uh, airports, and et cetera, et cetera, roads infrastructure. Uh, I'll share with you uh, recent updates about these uh, very important um, uh, projects. So this year we, we want to start construction of a new port, new deep sea port in Anakli in Georgia, in the Black Sea. Uh, also, the railway modernization is in progress, and this will be completed this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the capacity of the railroad in Georgia will be doubled, uh, which will, will reach uh, more than four, uh, 48 million uh, tons. Uh, we're also going to start the construction of a new airport, because we want to position ourselves as, a, as an aviation hub in Georgia, because of its uh, location, has full potential uh, to develop itself, uh, to position itself as, a, as an aviation hub as well. Uh, all the infrastructure projects, such as the road, uh, east-west highway, everything is going to be completed this year, and, the, and uh, other important projects also will be completed in two years' time. So, um, I also want to mention the, the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, China's uh, interest into this uh, uh, alternative route, so-called Middle Corridor. I had a very successful trip to China last year. Uh, I met with President Xi Jinping and uh, we decided to elevate our uh, partnership to the strategic level. Uh, China's uh, interest has been declared uh, several months ago by President Xi uh, regarding the Middle Corridor. And I think uh, this will give more impetus and more energy to, this, uh, to the development of this, uh, this corridor. So, once again, I want to take this opportunity and uh, publicly thank uh, all the EU leaders who supported uh, uh, the historic decision uh, to grant uh, Georgia uh, the Kenyan uh, status. This is a huge achievement of our government because uh, since we came to power in 2012, we made uh, enormous efforts and uh, big progress on our EU integration path, association agreement, uh, free trade agreement, uh, visa-free, and now this was culminated uh, uh, by this decision and Georgia became EU candidate country. Also want to mention very briefly that Georgia's economy since 2012, since we came to power, uh, doubled uh, yes. in US dollars. Uh, in the last three years only, uh, Georgia's GDP in US dollars doubled in per capita ways. Mm -hmm. uh, because in 2020, uh, US, uh, per capita US dollar in US dollars was $4,250, something like that. More than eight. And um, uh, this year it will be $8,600 already. Yeah, so, therefore, this is, uh, this is a recent update okay. about Georgia. So, once again, thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak about our work. Our Very impressive. Story. A lot is happening. Thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister. If I could go to you, Madame Renaud Basso, uh, again, President, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So, I'm originally Czech. I remember how uh, we were always watching uh, the numbers that were coming out from EBRD when you were assessing our economy. Because you have so you have those you have those two roles that you play. Of course, you are a bank, you are uh, in co-investing, etc. But you're also uh, providing analysis on the economic picture of the economies that you're working in. So, if I could start with that, with your experience and and how closely I know you're watching uh, this region, if we can call it that, or this space. How do you think, just overall, these economies are prepared for this? Uh, changing world economy that is out there. How would you assess the current state of economic affairs uh, in these economies? And then we can also go to the middle corridor. No, I think that um, as the two examples, first of all, thank, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And, and uh, indeed for EBRD, the development of the, this region is very important and we are investing in, in all the countries uh, represented participating to this panel, and we see the region are very strategic and um, dynamic in terms of growth. Of course, it depends from country to country. Each country has, has uh, challenges, opportunities, and, and so forth, so they are in different situations. But um, in the current geopolitical context, as it was outlined by President Vucic, the strategic importance of this region in linking Asia with Europe is has been increasing very substantially. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and we see um, appetite for reform um, in, in a number of countries, appetite for diversification, 
being more, um, one of the strategic um, priority, I think, of all the countries is to be more involved, more active in the global supply chain, um, and uh, to benefit from the opportunities of the change, I mean, the changes of the world economy, um, this reorganization of supply chain, for example, and, and the development of new opportunities in terms of investment, manufacturing, and so forth. I think the key issue of connectivity, which is at the core of this discussion today, is, is absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, I mean, I would say a few words on, on Middle Corridor. There is also a, a, an issue I would like to, fl to flag, which is the importance of the green transition and how mm -hmm. this region can be a very important driver of the green transition for, for several reasons, because it, it, all these countries have a huge potential in terms of renewable, clean energy. They can become net exporter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of them in Georgia is already fully, I mean, very highly uh, relying on, um, on uh, hydropower, but can go beyond in developing uh, diversification in solar, wind, and so forth. And this green transition, we, a number of countries are also still very dependent on fossil fuel, coal, and so forth. Serbia, that's a big, uh, big, um, big issue for Serbia. But I think the embracing this transition and investing in uh, accompanying this transition creates opportunity mm -hmm. to export to Europe, but also for the sake of the country. It will be a component of competitiveness because uh, new FDI, new invest investors are looking now for clean energy in order to be able to, I mean, um, to, to sell with uh, the, I mean, and, and to, to find customers looking for um, green products. Or, and and, uh, and um, Europe is developing a cross border, uh, CBAM, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So all this is an important dimension of the investment we are doing. And what we see is all the countries defining ambitious targets, plan to facilitate investment and, uh, in renewable, to invest in the grid, at low in countries level, but also um, the interconnection um, uh, between countries. So that's one key priority for us, mm -hmm. and we are working with all these countries in this, in this uh, field. Middle corridor is for, us, is for us also very important. We've done a big study um, with the support of the EU Commission on what are the different uh, options and scenarios and so forth, and we are putting our money where, where our mouth is. We start investing in Kazakhstan, in uh, the different countries, on. on railway, um, ports, um, and uh, what will be very important to be successful is to have a global approach, a consistent approach, and, that, I mean, it's, and it's a big challenge because you have a number of countries uh, which have to, to, I mean, if you want to have a full corridor, you have to have all the bits and pieces working together. Mm -hmm. So this will require uh, the appropriate governance and having a strategic vision a lot of investment, physical infrastructure, but also a lot of soft connectivity, customs cooperation, um, um, simplification of the procedure at the frontiers, and so forth. So there will be, that's a huge endeavor, a lot of work, but I think it's very much, um, very much needed, and, and we are fully committed to play our role in this respect. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could go to um, a Minister of National Economy of Kazakhstan, Mr. Kuantirov. Um, so obviously a pivotal economy uh, in Central Asia. I was able to also be there with you at the Astana Forum. As I told you just before the panel, I was, was uh, quite, uh, quite a detailed speech also from your uh, president on the economy, very forward looking. Uh, so again, nuts and bolts, where is Kazakhstan right now, but also what can we expect? And what are you really particularly investing in, uh, in terms of future competitiveness? <laughs> Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, presidents, prime ministers, um, <coughs> uh, CEOs. Well, uh, first of all, I would extend my gratitude for uh, giving me a chance to participate at this meeting, and I think it's a very important and crucial topic for the whole region. Uh, regarding the economic developments uh, in our country, so we, we've been growing uh, throughout 2023 uh, for about 5%. Uh, we are ex expecting some additional data. Uh, and uh, we had a record FDI, gr FDI uh, uh, inflow in 2022, which is of $28 billion, which was the record for the last uh, 12 years. And uh, we're also- eight billion. 28 billion, yeah, FDI. It's, and this it's year, bigger, in 2020... Bigger, yeah. Eric, yeah. it's bigger than Spain. 
Uh -huh. And in 2023, we're expecting almost the same figures, though we actually target about 24, 25. Um, the current geopolitical situation, of course, it had some repercussions with our economy, but our economy adapted, uh, so to say, in, in the first four or five a month, uh, and our businesses, the government, though it was quite an unprecedented time. Uh, and uh, uh, we are expecting FDI, and our, expect, uh, our FDI is just diversifying also. If, uh, for example, in, at the beginning of 2000s, 75% of F FDI came uh, into the oil and gas and mineral sector, mm -hmm. now it's only 50%, and others go to renewables, others go to uh, services and um, <laughs> other uh, sectors. Uh, so, uh, Kazakhstan positions itself uh, to be a food and uh, energy hub uh, security security hub uh, and uh, since we are also uh, fully fulfilling ourselves uh, with uh, energy and food we're also ready to export more and more and uh, our food especially is considered to be eco-friendly with uh, z almost zero GMOs and uh, we are attracting more investments in the agricultural sphere uh, from from the foreign side uh, that who are interested in importing Kazakh uh, our food and especially meat, poultry and others. And by the way, uh, in 2023, Kazakhstan was number six, ranked number six according to FDI intelligence uh, in uh, investment momentum. We, our, our GDP in 2023 is 265 billion dollars, uh, and we um, plan to to double the GDP by 2029 uh, to at least 450 uh, compared to 2022. But according to our estimation, it probably we, we will come to half a trillion dollars uh, by 2023. So one of the diversification uh, directions is, of course, the development of uh, infrastructure, including the Trans-Caspian International um, uh, Transport Route, which is the middle corridor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're investing quite a lot. So this corridor is an alternative co corridor for the uh, our traditional routes which yet are also of uh, great importance for us but at the same time of course we're also looking being a landlocked country we're also seeking different other directions to export our goods and uh, I proudly can say that uh, with the help of uh, our friends in Azerbaijan uh, Georgia and Turkey we signed uh, two roadmaps on the development of the middle corridor and uh, uh, Mr. Gary Bashuli has uh, already mentioned that. Uh, and uh, proud to say that in 2023, uh, the experts uh, through the middle corridor, through the Caspian Sea, uh, from our two ports, Aktau and Kurik, rose by 86% to uh, up to 2.8 million uh, tons. And uh, in general, uh, the four countries uh, are expecting it to you know to to have the the potential by 2025 to to increase it uh, up to 10 million tons and including in these 2.8 million tons 1.5 million uh, tons of oil have been uh, exported uh, for the first time and uh, of course this is not uh, and the development infrastructure development is not only being done by ourselves we have uh, national and foreign investors. We are working very closely with international financial organizations, including the BRD, EBRD. And EBRD, I think, is playing a very crucial role, uh, has been playing recently, especially due to some <clears throat> uh, uh, known uh, reasons. And we are having a very strong strategic partnership. And Ms. Basso, Madame Basso, will be uh, discussing this uh, soon uh, in, in our bilateral uh, meeting. From our side, we are also not only developing the Caspian part, yeah. but also the south part of Kazakhstan, uh, for example, the Darbaza Maktaral uh, railroad, which connects Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan as well, since Uzbekistan is also, you know, it's a double landlocked country, one of the two, together with yeah. Liechtenstein. Uh, and uh, a great, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a great uh, transit uh, of goods uh, from China to Europe. So within this uh, West Europe, West um, China corridor together, you know, uh, also uh, connecting the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, is, has a very great potential with the whole economy growing. And after, you know, the, after, in a post-COVID war when, the, when China opened its borders, so it's just, you know, uh, devouring all the goods from other countries. So the economy is, 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 
is, is, is booming. Uh, and uh, we're doing it uh, together with uh, uh, the Sing Singaporean uh, uh, PSA company, with Abu Dhabi Port and others. And we are uh, also uh, working with uh, Turkish companies on you know, managing our airports. So the best available technologies and experiences that could be uh, provided to Kazakhstan. We're trying to use this, and uh, of course, we should do it simultaneously with our partners on the other side of the Caspian Sea, together with Georgia, with uh, uh, Azerbaijan, and I think we have very good understanding of what to do. And by the way, uh, the end of March is the term for our three countries to uh, finalize uh, the transportation integration uh, uh, things, including digitalization. I think digitalization is one of the most important uh, instruments and horizontal measures to develop every, almost every sphere of economy, especially the, in the infrastructure. And as uh, Madame Basso mentioned, also we have to think about the green economy. And we, while doing this, of course, we are also thinking uh, the uh, carbon footprint. And Kazakhstan is the only country in Central Asian region to have developed uh, the carbon neutrality strategy. Now we're working on the action plan uh, by 2060. And we should keep in mind all of these uh, trends, of course. Uh, we bought uh, two oil tankers recently and also are uh, planning to buy additional ones to uh, export more oil. And of course, European companies are very much welcomed to participate in this work, especially East European countries, so from Black Sea going to Romania, Lithuania, Austria, Germany, and many other countries. And I think it's not only about the infrastructural uh, transportation <coughs> connectivity, it's also connecting people, connecting ideas. Uh, technologies and in general uh, defragmenting uh, the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will still try to do one more round that will be uh, uh, a quick one. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Mr. Alper, Chief Executive Officer Sabanchi Holding, Turkey. Um, first, if I could ask, uh, how do you view kind of the nuts and bolts of the Turkish economy? Obviously, uh, a huge connector also in this tissue of uh, Europe uh, and Asia, a huge energy hub uh, as well. And I could go on and on. Uh, there is also a lot of attention of obviously being paid in the international community to some of the macroeconomic steps that are being taken. So how, how do you view it um, uh, from the private sector perspective? Over to you. Thank you very much, first of all, inviting me to such a privileged panel. Uh, probably I am the only one in the panel commuting every single day from Asia to Europe, <laughs> Europe to Asia. Nice. So that's why it I value... in Istanbul. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I value the investments on infrastructure, and also I highly value, appreciate the value of having alternatives in my roots. Similar, uh, I think, in this middle corridor discussions. Uh, yes, Turkey is one of the G20 economies uh, connecting Europe and Asia together, not just with transportation, multimodal transportation alternatives, but also with, you know, we have four bridges between two countries. We have two tunnels, uh, we have sea transportation, we have gas pipelines, we have grids connecting, and we have data lines connecting two continents together. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, we have cultures connecting uh, two continents together. So that's extremely important. Uh, as Sabanji Group, uh, we are active in three different businesses, uh, energy, uh, financial services, banking, and also industrials, and we are active in 16 different countries. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, So we are procuring, we are selling uh, more than 100 countries in the world. And today, uh, pandemic has uh, learned us that actually resilience of supply chains, having alternatives in those supply chains. Also now with all these net zero initiatives, actually the, uh, you know, GHG emissions of the supply chains are becoming more and more critical. So having alternatives uh, to maritime, where right now, if you see the attacks in Red Sea, is extremely critical actually for the resilience uh, and uh, you know confidence of the supply chains. Uh, these routes are extremely critical. We have to make uh, these routes shorter, uh, more uh, efficient. 
uh, and more connected. So I highly value the middle corridor initiative, and I believe Turkey, Turkey is the main actor over there connecting uh, the continents uh, with multimodal transportation, with its infrastructure investments. Uh, and if you look to Turkey economy, uh, you know, we are very well positioned uh, actually uh, in two continents uh, with our highly educated, probably in the region we have the best educated workforce uh, and uh, growth rate of alternative industries is extremely uh, you know high in turkey and then as you rightfully said we are an energy uh, hub and also transporter as Tur uh, Turkey, uh, especially green transition will play a critical role not just with the potential of renewal of turkey but also producing green hydrogen and transporting this between the continents. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So if I could now go a quick second round just for some quick reactions. And uh, President, Mr. President, you mentioned also of the geostrategic picture and uh, geoeconomic relations. Um, now um, there is a new growth uh, agenda also from the EU. Um, um, and you know the relationship very well. So how do you, from your standpoint, how do you see this new initiative from the EU toward the Western Balkans and including your country? Is it enough? Is it the right thing to do? What, what, uh, what is missing potentially? Whenever you gather us from the Western Balkans, my great friend Iraqi Garibashvili was together with me in a Chatham household panel last night and you were present as well, Eric, and uh, you can always see that there is a combination speaking about uh, people's relationship, people from, from the Western Balkans' relationship towards European Union. One is uh, always flattering EU officials and on the other, other hand crying and complaining about lack of money. <laughs> and uh, this is not a case with, uh, with Serbia. Um, I don't do it, and I didn't do it last night. I never do it. Because I'm profoundly grateful to EU taxpayers for giving us whatever. Mm -hmm. Why would they do it? They have their own countries. But are they helpful? Yes, they're helpful. Many thanks for that. Can it be much more? Yes, it can. It can be less. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to say, because I listened very carefully to these great people, what we don't see from Europe, because we believe that we are above the others from no reasons. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you something, you heard Iraqi. Doesn't matter uh, what will happen in a year, two or five, about his political career, although I believe that he deserved to reign the country forever with his numbers. If you remember when Georgia was a big skyrocketing star on geopolitical sky of Europe and that part of a bit of Asia as well, what was the growth rate of Georgia at that time? Almost zero, one, 1.5 percent. Today, nobody is speaking about this terrific results of yeah. Iraqi, Gary Bashvili, and Jomar Tokayev as well, and his government. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, well, we cannot brag ourselves of such results in Europe. And when you ask me whether they can, what they can do regarding growth uh, agenda, I'll, I'll have a meeting with Ursula von der Leyen within two hours. And I say, many thanks for everything you have done so far. If you can be helpful, good. But please help yourself as well, because we need, I'll tell you this in a very honest way, we need a uh, stronger Germany. We need, uh, because when they cough, we got pneumonia. And when they contract minus 0.3%, then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have plus 4.5, not plus 3.5 or whatever. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are the issues, which is important. But I wanted to add one more thing about Iraqi, let's say. 
You noticed one sentence. He mentioned, he said, okay, now we are pulling up our relationship with China on a strategic level. And he's going to face very soon the same type of questions which I was always facing. Why are you doing that? Are you closer to China or to European Union? He needs to work for the benefit of his country. He cannot work easily and successfully without having Chinese investments, without working very closely with them. And people in Europe, they need to understand that. And they will make bigger influence of European Union understanding that, not making pressure on him, on me, or on someone else. Because I'm not going to deprive my country of 30% of Chinese investments. I have no right to do so. Mm -hmm. Do I have the right to do something against European 60 to 65 percent? No. And we'll never do it. Mm -hmm. And we'll always appreciate, we'll always respect it. But this, this is the only thing that we ask to get this, to have this kind of freedom of choice to do whatever we can for our own countries and that's it. And I believe if uh, we'll be able to sustain that, then uh, it's a good future ahead of us. Thank you so we much. Our countries, at least. Thank you. Um, we have about. But we can't do many things without TBRD. <laughs> <laughs> Madame Basso. That's clear. That's clear. <laughs> I didn't want to make you angry. <laughs> <laughs> so we have like, five minutes. So if you can give me quick reactions. Um, that's what I think. Mr. Prime Minister, and that's why actually we did it. That's why we wanted to make sure at the beginning you can actually uh, put the data out there about the economies. Yeah, I admire them. Uh, yeah, I envy them. It's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, having said that, obviously, and I, we were, Mr. Prime Minister, we were at a panel together here last year, so that was more of a geostrategic conversation, but still, if I could ask you, if you don't mind, uh, South Caucasus, uh, the relationship with Azerbaijan, uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, Georgia, of course, is a critical stakeholder there, I know you are, so how do you view it, if you can share, uh, many people are curious. Sure. Well, regarding the security situation in the South Caucasus, uh, first of all, of course, you remember the, uh, uh, the occupation of our sovereign territories. Russia still occupies 20% of our territories, and we had, uh, yesterday we discussed about this. Um, 2008, when we had this war, uh, after that war, Russia uh, built military bases and uh, still continues uh, the uh, to occupy 20 percent of our territory uh, but regardless of this uh, challenge the security challenge uh, we managed to achieve an unprecedented and uninterrupted decade of peace and stability mm -hmm. which brought prosperity economic growth to georgia since we regained our independence we've never experienced such a peaceful stable uh, situation in georgia like like now like it is now uh, regarding the uh, neighboring countries with uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, we have a very close uh, relationship and partnership uh, with both countries. They are our brothers, they are our friends. And I did try uh, two years ago to mediate or facilitate, and we did successfully uh, a first mediation when Azerbaijan released uh, 15 detainees and Armenia gave the maps for the mine territories to Azerbaijan. So this was a successful attempt, but uh, it's a very complex situation. We understand there are many players uh, in, the, in, in, the, in this region. And um, what, I, what, I'm, what I want to add to that is that uh, I know that uh, now the position of uh, both leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia is that they want to uh, deal with each other on a bilateral level. Personally, I think this is the right, uh, right way to do, because with all the stakeholders, with all the mediators, sometimes it's, it becomes more conflicting and more, uh, you know, counter, uh, less pro counterproductive, counterproductive. So therefore, I wish them, I wish them all, the, all the best. Uh, so I, I very much hope that they will find a uh, solution and uh, they will soon uh, sign the uh, peace agreement. Thank you so much. I'll go to Madame Renovasso, just in a, but just to finish on the, Kazakhstan, um, Central Asia, um, I remember that uh, there is a lot still, and you mentioned it, Minister, a lot to be done in terms of also coordination 
among the different countries uh, on uh, all kinds of cross-border procedures, etc. Um, just curious, can we expect out of this momentum around the middle corridor and the work that we're doing on transportation links, etc., can we expect um, bigger integration? Can we expect some new partnerships in, among the Central Asian countries? Uh, I think absolutely, yeah, there is a, there is a chance for that and uh, great opportunities, even uh, without being in some uh, framework of uh, integrational framework, uh, like in the customs union, we can do it together uh, as what we are doing together with uh, Azerbaijan, with Georgia and, and Turkey, so, and also uh, Central Asian countries. So different countries in, in the region, the, we, we are with some of them in one union, in another union, there is also an organization of Turkic states. Uh, for example, where uh, Turkey is also a part participant. Uh, but uh, I think even without formalizing some, uh, um, some of these customs unions, so in general, it is for the, for the best uh, interests of each country. And I think, uh, as uh, Mr. President, you mentioned, uh, every country, every government is responsible for its people, for its economy. So it's not, must, it must be not about uh, being pro-Chinese or pro-Russian or pro-American something. Uh, it must be pro-Kazakh, pro-Serbian, pro-Georgian, yes. etc. So uh, it must be in the best interest of each country. And if the points merge, then we can find uh, common solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so we have two more speakers. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I could uh, go to you briefly. Private sector. Let's finish on, on that on that note, uh, uh, Madame Renaud Basso. I know you are always having that in your view. How how those investments that you're making are also then crowding in private sector. So what would be the things you would mention? We have uh, business leaders here. I'm sure a lot are also watching. And the same then question also to Mr. Alper. Over to you. No, I would say that there are a lot of opportunities. And you've heard about uh, very positive stories about um, uh, two countries in Eurasia. And, uh, and I think that um, the, the strategic positioning of the region, the reform agenda embraced by uh, the country leadership and so forth, creates a lot of opportunities uh, to invest in, um, in, this, uh, in these countries. We are supporting them. We are, I mean, um, we are supporting infrastructure, but also financing directly private sector. For us, it's a key priority, and 75% of what we are doing is in the private sector. So, um, so we are confident that um, the country will develop and grow, and it's good to make business there. Thank you. And Mr. Alper, um, what would be the things that would make you even more invested in the region? Less political tensions, better cooperation and collaboration between the countries, and thanks to EVRD, but also uh, I think we expect some incentives from all the countries so that we are more motivated to make investments in the region. Excellent. Thank you. This concludes this session. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.